Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church on this Easter morning. It is good to be with you all. If you are visiting for the first time, we have a gift for you on your way out this morning. Please stop and allow us to hand that to you before you leave. And if you are not yet a member and you would like to join in the life of this congregation in membership, we invite you to talk to any of the pastors following worship this morning. Today is a high holy day, and tomorrow might be the second highest holy day for those of us who work in the church. The church office will be closed tomorrow. If you need anything, we will get back to you on Tuesday morning. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us worship the risen Christ this morning. Please rise and body your spirit for the call to worship. Beloved church, behold the victory of our God. Jesus, our Lord, has conquered the grave. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Sin and death shall reign no more. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Let this place resound with joy. Christ is risen. Alleluia.
Please join me in the prayer of adoration. Glory to you, O God. You have won victory over death, raising Jesus from the grave and giving us eternal life. Glory to you, O Christ, for us and for our salvation. You overcame death and opened the gate to everlasting life. Glory to you, O Holy Spirit. You lead us into the truth. Glory to you, O blessed Trinity, now and forever. Amen. May the peace of Jesus Christ be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the power of your spirit, roll away the stone and reveal to us the word of life. Amen. Our first scripture reading is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. At this time in our worship service, I invite all children to come forward and meet me up here on the floor. And if you have your offering, you can bring it for the joyful noise pail at this time.
Christ is risen. You say he is risen indeed. You ready? Here we go. Christ is risen. Oh, we can shout it with a lot more joy and excitement. Let's hear it. Christ is risen. Beautiful. Let's try it one more time. Christ is risen. Good job. Good morning. It is good to be in worship with you all this morning. As in just a few moments, we will hear Pastor Brian read our second scripture for today. And from our Bibles, it is about the empty tomb. Jesus' friends, who were very sad when Jesus died a couple of days before this scripture, were very surprised when they got to the tomb and it was empty just a couple of days later. And so this is the story that makes the cross from a sad thing to a very happy and beautiful thing. It reminds us that no matter what happens, no matter how hard things get, that God is always with us. And that can make us very happy. And that's why we celebrate today and that we shout things like Christ is risen, Oh, I tricked you. You can do it again. Here we go. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. And we shout hallelujahs. We can do that again. We shout hallelujah. When we say hallelujah, it's like saying hooray for God. Look what God has done. And so for today, we are going to give you these butterflies. All right, so before you leave up here, you can take a butterfly with you back to your seat in one moment. Because often, butterflies are symbols at Easter. For one, Easter's in the spring and butterflies come out in the spring, right? We see a lot more of them. But also, butterflies don't start like this, right? They start as tiny little caterpillars. And then they go, yep, we know, where they go into a cocoon, right? And then they become... You guys could do this for me. Yeah. <laughs> then they become butterflies. They come out of their cocoon, and they're very beautiful butterflies, right? And they're all different kinds and all really beautiful. And so it's a surprise when they come out of their cocoon, right? We're not expecting something so beautiful to come out of that cocoon, And so it's a surprise of what God can do, and it's good news. And we say, Alleluia! Alleluia! Oh, we can say, Alleluia! Alleluia! So you're going to take your beautiful butterflies with you today, and may it be a reminder of all of God's promises to be with us, God's beautiful love. Let's go to God in prayer, and then I know we're anxious to get our butterflies. You can put on your prayer hands and repeat after me. Dear Dear Jesus, Jesus, we celebrate with hallelujahs today. We praise you for the promise that you are always with us. Help us to see your beauty in our world. We love you. We love you. And all God's children say, Amen. Okay, friends, so we're going to hand out butterflies, and Miss Maggie is going to help me. So if we can create a line over with Miss Maggie, and then we'll get you butterflies and back to your seats with your families.
Our second reading comes to us from Mark chapter 16, starting at verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on, on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, They saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. But he said to them, "Uh, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. Uh, He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. Uh, But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement has seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Join me in a word of prayer. Uh, Risen Christ, uh, saving spirit, holy one. Uh, You are the alpha and the omega. You are the beginning after the end. And so we ask that you once again, once anew, calm our alarms, open our minds, and speak resurrection into our hearts. We love you, Lord. Amen. Uh, So, true story, uh, we don't actually know the ending to the Gospel of Mark. Uh, Have y'all ever heard this before? Is this new news to anybody? Uh, We don't actually know the original ending to the Gospel of Mark. It's no messianic secret or anything. This one's out there. We publicize it in our works there. So if you want to fact check me, uh, open up your pew Bibles there. They're spread out. You can grab it. It's okay. Turn to page 55. It's the second 55, not the first one because we're in the New Testament now. So go to page 55. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about there. Uh, It says on the page there, it says, uh, Mark 16, towards the end, uh, one section is labeled the shorter ending to the Gospel of Mark. Uh, The other one is labeled the longer ending. Very creative titles, you can tell, right? It says the longer ending right there. So you have two endings right there listed in the Bible. Now, if you took it out, take a pencil, and I want you to circle which one you think is right and pass your Bible to the left. This is going to be an open book test today. We're going to solve this once and for all, but uh, it is kind of odd, though, isn't it? We don't exactly know the ending to the Gospel of Mark. I don't know about you, but endings are pretty important in my world. Uh, Endings, I think, are pretty uh, crucial. They're vital to things. Um, Back in the day, believe it or not, I'm old enough, um, I remember going to see a motion picture on the big screen. Anybody else remember that? All right, sensing your reaction, I'm obviously the oldest person in the room, so let me go ahead and boom explain this to you real quick. And so um, when you were old enough back in the day and you went to the movies, um, they had something called a film strip. And so they had pictures on this film strip, and then you had picture after picture, and they moved it. So it was a moving picture, a motion picture, and it just kept going and going and going. And so you'd see picture after picture after picture, and they'd go so fast that it looked like something. So a strip of film and a light and a projector going through the film to project it onto the big screen, and that was going to the movie. Well, I remember going to the movie once, and the film, uh, the film strip, uh, it broke. Uh, The film strip just completely broke. It literally broke, and we couldn't see the end of the movie. And so we couldn't watch the end, and so they came over the loudspeaker, and they said, well, we're sorry, but it broke. You're going to have to go now. And so we walk outside, and there's the 
the manager to the movie theater standing there, and he said, I am so sorry, we want to offer you a half refund on your movie. And I said, half? And they said, yeah, I mean, you saw most of it. I said, but we didn't see the ending. I mean, the ending's what makes it worth it. The ending's why you're here. And he said, well, I've actually seen that ending, and trust me, sir, it's just not worth it that much. And so, <laughs> endings are pretty important though, right? Endings are are pretty important to me. Uh, Gospels. Gospels are pretty important, right? I think the Gospels are pretty important to all of us. That's why we're here today. And so it's just weird to me that ending and gospel, and we, we haven't figured it out yet. We still don't exactly know the ending of the Gospel of Mark. It's strange, isn't it? People keep arguing about this stuff. Uh, a lot of folks say that there's two endings because of the way it's listed in the Bibles, right? Uh, most Bibles list it that way, shorter ending, longer ending, count them up, and that's two. I'm not great at math, but I can do that one. So a lot of folks say two endings, but then when you start to dig into it a little bit, uh, the translations list them that way to let folks know that there's at least two possible endings, maybe three or four or maybe more out there. Uh, for instance, another way some say that the Gospel of Mark ends is actually with our passage today, with, with verse 8, chapter 16, verse 8. They say that's the final chapter, final verse right there, and, and that's how it ends. Uh, if you look back in the Bible, the longer version starts right after that. It starts with verse 9, and it's 9 through 20, so that's 12 verses. That's 274 more words, and so that's longer, right? That is a longer ending. Uh, the shorter ending comes right in between the two, and the shorter ending doesn't even have a number by it. That's weird, right? We number everything these days, and there's no number there. It's just stuck right in between verse 8 and verse 9, and it reads like this. It says, um, And all that they had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter, and afterwards Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Well, I, I don't know about you, but... That kind of sounds like map testing to me in the schools. It's like read the story and offer a succinct concluding sentence. It just doesn't really, it doesn't fit the flow. It doesn't make sense to have that add on there unless there's a reason for it, unless there's a reason somebody added that there. But. So you see, you got the long, you got the short, you got the shorter, you got the shortest. Sometimes there's an amen, sometimes there's not. All of these uh, have these multiple endings to the Gospel of Mark and even our passage today. Uh, two of the five oldest ancient scrolls we have still pretty much intact. Two of the five actually end with our passage today at verse 8. Uh, I guess that's the shorter -er version, right? So that's the shorter -er version in which you end just at chapter 8. And I want to read it one more time, and this is how it would end then. It says, So they went out and fled from the tomb. For terror and amazement has seized them. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Huh. Uh, David Bartlett's a former professor of mine. He's a Bible scholar. He's a, he's a personal hero. I love the man. David Bartlett once said, uh, if I was a betting man, um, and he was a betting man, but he was a Baptist, so I had to do it in private, you know, and so... Um, <laughs> David Bartlett said, if I were a betting man and I had to bet on what the last original verse was to the Gospel of Mark, I would bet on that verse. I would bet on verse 8. And he said, here's a few reasons why. Here's a few reasons for this. Uh, one, it's the shortest. Uh, when you're reading ancient scripts, usually the shorter one is the more accurate one because there just isn't much room, and so people would elongate over time. But early on, it was super short. And two, it's the weirdest. It's the weirdest ending to the Gospel of Mark, and it, it leaves you feeling slightly uncomfortable as an ending. Listen again. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, even though they'd just been commanded to go out and tell. They said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. It leaves you feeling slightly uncomfortable as an ending, doesn't it? Now, you can imagine why some scribes in the early church 
uh, might have felt the need to add on to this ending, right? Maybe a shorter or a longer or an alternate ending. You, you can sense why they, they thought it needed a little something more. They said, whoa, whoa, whoa let's just let's add a summary real quick. Let's add a succinct summary real quick. Or, or, or let's, let's put something in there about salvation. Let's add something about salvation. That'll tie it up. Or, or maybe, maybe, maybe the ascension or the appearances or, or the Great Commission. I hear that's going to be huge. Let's, let's add something in there. Let's, let's add something to this because it just, it leaves me uncomfortable. And we can imagine why they, they might have perhaps, after verse 8, thought they needed to wrap it up a bit differently and, and put a prettier bow on that gospel message, Right? Because endings are important. Endings are vital. And ending with terror and silence and fear, well, that's a little weird, isn't it? I don't think we can fault the early scribes for this, though. I think this is a natural human tendency. When we're uncomfortable, we try to make ourselves less uncomfortable, right? Right? It's a natural human tendency, and I don't want to play the blame game here. That's not why we're here either today. Uh, We also like to control the narrative, just like they were trying to do. We like to try to control the narrative. We do this all the time. We try to take control of the story that's happening. And so uh, we say we want to get out in front of the press, right? Or we say something like, well, we want to tell our side of the story first, right? Um, Why do you think they fight over who gets to write the history books? Uh, There's power when you take control of the narrative. Uh, And we do this all the time. Pro move, best way to control any story is by controlling the ending, right? If you want to control the story, you got to control the ending because uh, that's where the power is. That's where the the ultimate power is right there. It says, uh, well, we lost because the referee blew it. You're trying to control the story by controlling the ending, right? Or you say something like, well, we split ways because it just wasn't cost effective anymore. Uh, Control the ending, I knew it was over because they stopped taking my suggestions. Yeah, see, I'd, I don't think it would be fair for us to fault the early scribes one bit if they were scribing those ancient texts and they got to that ending and they thought, well, maybe there was something left out of this and maybe I'll just add on this, this little reshaping or this little revisiting or this little editing piece because it... it Endings are important. Endings are vital. And so we do this all the time. We do this all the time when we look back. We do this all the time when we're living it in the present even. We do this all the time in real time. Uh, Even as the story is playing out, even as the story is still unfolding, we say, well, if I do this, it'll end up with that. Or if we do these, then I'll end up over there with those. And so we attempt to shape the story even as we're living it out. We want to aim towards the ending that we're angling at, right? So we, we want to steer it in the way we want to towards that ending. And this, this happens. We do this all of life. We do this. Me, you, everybody does this. Uh, they even did it back then. They even did it back then and then wrote about it. They even did it in the Gospel of Mark, if you think about it. There's nothing new Uh, Judas tried to control the ending. He tried to end it with a kiss, right? Uh, The chief priests, they tried to control the ending. They tried to purchase the ending that they wanted, right? Yeah, we try to shape the story and aim towards the ending that we want. It's, It's natural. It's normal. This is basic narrative structure. The best way to control any story is by controlling the ending. We know this. The scribes knew this. The early church knew this. The people living in the Bible times knew this. The best way to control any story is by taking control of the ending. And the better best way, the better best way to control the story is by taking control of the ending with a group of people who want to aim at the same ending as you. Because then you got backup, right? The chief priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Herod and Pilate and Caiaphas, the religious leaders, the politicians, the soldiers, they had backup. They were all aiming towards the same ending together. 
Now, all the powers and all the principalities at play on that day, they, they all got together to shape the ending that they thought would be best. And then, and then they, they put it together in motions. It's like a picture show. It's just they put it together in motion. They started moving through the pictures, moving through the pictures, and they said, uh, trial, 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 accuse, blame. Keep it rolling. Keep it rolling. Don't stop. Keep it rolling. And then he says, uh, judge, and, and pass off, and then condemn, condemn. Doesn't matter what he says. Just keep it rolling. Just keep it rolling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mock, spit, beat. Keep it rolling. Keep it rolling. And, and crowd, crying, crucify. Just keep it rolling. Just, just don't stop it. Just keep the flow. Keep the flow. Keep going. Uh, march, skull, hill, crown, thorns, robe. Keep it rolling. Keep it rolling. Nail, 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 cross, cross, cross. Keep it going. Keep it going. And leave them there to die. That's the picture we want for the ending. Just get everything in motion and just get it going. We've got all the backup we need. Just get us to that frame and then we're good. That was the ending that they picked. That was the ending that they wanted. and It was the ending that they got, if we're honest. They got to that frame, didn't they? And see, this is what I mean. The ending of the Gospel of Mark is complicated. It's fuzzy. There's endings left and right. There's endings all over the places. This is the ending that they got. And so, so is that an ending? Is that, is that the main ending? Is that, is that the ending to the Gospel of Mark? Jesus on a cross, is that the ending? Because in some ways it was, right? Uh, that was the end of him. That was the end of his life. That was the end of Jesus on that day. It was an ending, Jesus on the cross. Uh, It was an end to the religious anxiety about his blasphemy. It was an end to the Roman worry about their rebellion. It was the end to him being a threat for all of them. It was an ending, Jesus on the cross. In so many ways, it was an ending. Uh, But even more than that, even more than that, just think bigger, scope out. In so many ways, it was the end of a long day. It was the end of a very long week. It was the end that was a long time coming, depending on who you asked. It was an ending. But even more than that, Jesus on the cross was the end of separation. It was the end of isolation. It was the end of feeling alone. It was an ending. Jesus on the cross, it was the end of pretending. It was the end of any pretense. It was the end of kidding ourselves. It was an ending. Jesus on the cross was the end of the power of sin. It was an end of the ransom of many. It was the end of the sacrificial system altogether. It was an ending. Jesus on the cross was the end of our guilt and our shame and our embarrassment. It was an ending. Jesus on the cross was the end of all anxiety and fear and worry. It was an ending. Jesus on the cross was the end of evil winning, even though it didn't look like that yet. Jesus on a cross was the end of hate being triumphant, even though it was hard to believe on that day. Jesus on a cross was the end of life as we had come to know it, and it was even the beginning of the end of death itself, but we hadn't quite seen it yet. You see what I mean? It's, it's complicated. It's odd. There's all sorts of endings in the Gospel of Mark. There's ending after ending after ending, and there are two or four or more, a lot of endings in there. And Jesus, Jesus even said from the cross, he said of all those things, he said, it is finished. That's an ending. Jesus said the end, period. We hit it. This is the ending. Jesus said it from the cross. And if, if Jesus said it, if this is an end, if this is the end, then that makes that day the last day, right? Then that would make that day the final day. That would make that day the conclusion of sorts. So why all the other words? Why do we keep going? Why do we keep debating about all this? What's the point of it? If Good Friday was actually the end, if that's the real ending of the Gospel of Mark, then what does that make today? What does that make our passage about? Uh, David Bartlett once said, if I were a betting man and I had to bet on what the last original verse written in the Gospel of Mark was, I would bet on that verse, verse 8. 
So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And he had a few reasons as to why. One, it's the shortest. Two, it's the weirdest. It leaves you feeling slightly uncomfortable as an ending. But three, that's because this whole section isn't an ending at all. It's actually the new beginning. It's actually the new beginning. Now, back to the text for just a second. Back to the text. It says, the Sabbath was over. That's how it starts out. Chapter 16, verse 1, the Sabbath was over. It was over. Something had happened. Something was done. Something had been completed. But yet, something new is about to because we just got to lead into a new paragraph. Uh, It says right after that, on the first day of the week, chapter 16, verse 2, on the first day of the week, first primary, initial, inaugural. This is opening day for something new. We're paying attention now. Then it says, when the sun had risen, text says S-U-N sun, but you can read S-O-N sun because we also know the context clues and we know what's going on. The sun had risen. Come on now. It says, if we dive back into the text for just a second, we realize exactly what this is about. This is not an ending at all. This is not meant to be an ending at all. This is the announcement of the new beginning that's happening. And here's where the hiccup happens. Here's where it comes. In the narration, we're told these things. We're told that it's the first day. The people in the Bible don't have it yet. The text, they don't know these things yet. They're just going to the tomb. They're going to the ending. They're going to where it all ended because they haven't quite figured it out yet. And so that's the reason. That's the reason for the terror and the silence and the fear They're trapped in the ending. They are trapped and they are focused on the end. They're caught up in the debate about the ending. They didn't realize yet that they were living in a brand new beginning. That chapter was finished. Something new was happening, but they didn't know. They sensed it, though. That's why the word amazement pops in there. Terror and amazement. They don't know what to do with these emotions. How many of us get caught up with the ending? How many of us get so caught up with the ending that we forget that Easter is about a new day? The old is gone. The chapter is finished. How many of us forget that today is the brand new day that starts it all? How many of us get so busy trying to shape the ending that we want or try to shape the ending that we think we want? How many of us are get so busy trying to deal with the ending that we think we've been dealt or the ending that we think we're stuck with in this life? Because today is not about endings, it's about something new. How many of us are so fixated on the end that we forget that we're living in a brand new beginning? Come on! It says right there, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, unless there is a good Friday in your life, there can be no Easter Sunday. It is because of that ending that we can live into this new beginning. Come on! N.T. Wright says, Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project. You are God's new project. I am God's new project. This world is God's new project. Come on! Jürgen Moltmann says, It is at Easter that the laughter of the redeemed and the dance of the liberated begins. Come on, friends. Christ has risen from the dead. The tomb is open. Come outside and see. It's a beautiful day. We need to get going for we are an Easter people at the new beginning of time. The Apostle Paul says, the old is gone, the new is here. Peter Petros the Rock says, by his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope. The angel simply said it like this, said, do not be alarmed. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, that's what he says. Friends, Easter is not an ending. Easter is never an ending. Don't get trapped in whatever end you feel might be ending you because Easter is the new beginning. It's the new beginning of you. It's the new beginning of me. It's the new beginning for this world. That's why we're here. That's what Easter is about. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The new beginning has begun. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Go out and be an Easter people. Go out and tell the world the good news. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, all God's people say, Amen. Amen.
Let us join our hearts in prayer. O gracious God of the crucified and risen Christ, we are so thankful on this Easter morning. We worship you with hearts full of gratitude, with music, celebrating once again that you are the God who works in unexpected ways. You are the God who proves that nothing is beyond your redemption. You are the God who makes a way when there seems to be no way. It's true, Lord, that your Easter story becomes our story because it's been your people's story since the very first morning of the empty tomb. You surprise us with resurrection, and then you keep working your miracles of hope and healing, and we can attest to it. Nothing we can do can thwart your purposes in Jesus Christ. No frightened band of disciples, no heavy stone, not our human frailties, nor our wavering belief, nothing in all creation, not even death, can separate us from your love known most fully in the dying and rising of your Son. Certainly your light shines in darkness, and darkness did not overcome it. And Lord, this morning we say he is risen, not only because it's part of our liturgy, but because it swells up from the very fiber of our being. For in knowing and believing that you have raised Christ from the dead and the ultimate death and resurrection, then surely you are with us too in our smaller deaths and resurrections. And loving God, we pray that because of the cross and the empty tomb, we might have the courage to let go of so many things that we hold so tightly, including the conclusions that we draw and the endings we concede, and that we trust you for whatever new life needs to be born this day. Draw us into your very real presence that we may be lifted to envision the world as your kingdom coming. And if you will, would you use our very lives to bring that vision more fully into focus? So, Lord, in these moments, we pray for your deep and abiding presence, would especially be close to those upon whose lips the song of triumph languishes today. We pray for peacemakers, for those around the globe that cry out for justice, for safety. We pray for those who grieve, especially when days like today make absence of one they love more real, for those who are lonely or ill, for those who are in prison and trapped in addictions, we pray for them. Lord, make some spirit radiant today that had not expected it. Surprise with hope some who have not dared to harbor it and bring to life those whose spirits are dead. And from the grave of self-defeat, let there be a resurrection here of love, of joy, of strength. Fill your whole church with the power that flows from the resurrection, that in the midst of a broken world, your church, by your grace, may signal the beginning, the beginning of a renewed humanity. Unite us with your followers who shout alleluia in huts and in cathedrals, in secret and in public, in languages different from our own, may we all sing the terrifyingly and amazingly good news that Christ is alive. Empower us to be about the proclamation of your love in our words and our deeds, and keep us humble and faithful, loving you, serving others, through the risen one we pray as you teach us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our very life is God's gift to us. All that we are, all that we have, and all that we love are gifts from God. With joy, let us acknowledge God's generosity, returning offerings for the ministry of others.
Let us pray. Generous God, accept our gifts with our joy and gratitude. Through the work of your church, turn them into blessings for others. Amen. Brothers, sisters, saints, as you go out of this place on this day, I send you with the same reminder that you always get. Uh, we don't go out alone, but we'll go out together as the body of Christ. And today we go out as an Easter people. If you feel trapped by an ending, whether it's because of sin or shame or guilt, or if you feel trapped by an ending because of hurt or pain, or if you feel trapped by an ending because of life circumstance or this world or things that are going on around you, on Friday, Jesus said, it is finished. And today, Jesus says, is the first day. It's the new beginning. Endings are important, but so are new beginnings. Go out and be an Easter people. Go with the grace and the peace of the God who created you, the God who redeems you, and the God who sustains you now and forevermore. Amen.